Welcome my wayward ones and join me as I prepare an edible fairy ring for a midsummer afternoon tea. But first, let's have a chat and craft 3D flower fairy lanterns to guide the way. As a little girl, I was lucky enough to be raised in a world where spirits were real, ancestors never really died, and plants lived magical lives with spirited companions found around the world, but most commonly referred to as Fae. These are parts of the spirits of land that I honor. For those of us who both honor and work with spirits of land and all that encompasses, we know that the truth of the Fae is not at all Disney related, although the kid in me does enjoy a good fairy tale story or movie. They are, however, a force to be reckoned with and the true stewards of the land. If we listen to their lessons and teachings, we can honor traditions passed down. But like humans, they have their own personality and agendas. Not all are in our favor. On the new moons, I make a very special offering to the ancestors of blood, land, and spirit. I ask for nothing. I simply offer a token of gratitude for the land I'm allowed to live on, learn from, be healed by, and nourished by. It's also important to note, while most known myths center around European cultures, the land spirits actually exist around the world in different forms and with different functions. I look forward to my live tea and tales Myths and Legends from the Caribbean that I'm hosting for my Patreons this month in honor of Midsummer. Shameless plug I know, but a girl's got a business to grow. One amazing way they are connected is through the legends and lores surrounding fairy rings. While the myths and legends are most commonly associated with mushrooms and are found, once again, in most European countries, they also exist as far as the Philippines and Africa. In fact, if I may put on my geek hat for a minute, there is a really interesting documentary on the African fairy rings on Prime Canada. Not sponsored, just saying. Since I am constructing a fairy ring inspired by European stories, I thought it would be fun to share some of them with you here. Most of which can easily be found on various websites, all of which seem to take their information from one source, Wikipedia. Now we all know the accuracy of that site can be hit or miss, so I'm relying on my online family who hail from all parts of the globe to correct any information that I have found and to add any additional stories you've heard in the comments below, so we can, as always, learn and grow together. At the end of the video, I will share two books that I purchased and plan to work on for more direct connection to the Fae. But for now, it's story time. So as I construct the three components of my edible fairy ring, which include edible moss mounds, edible stones, including hagstones to see the fairy through, and of course, the meringue mushrooms, I hope that you will grab a cuppa and sit for a spell as we talk folklore and magic on this midsummer afternoon. Now, before I get started, I do want to apologize for any and all mispronunciations that I'm going to try my best. A great deal of folklore surround fairy rings. Their names in European language often allude to supernatural origins. In France, they are known as Ronde de Saucere, witches' circles, where tradition states that fairy rings were guarded by giant bug-eyed toads that cursed those who violated the circles. In Germany, they are called Hexenring, once again, witches' rings, and it was believed to mark the site of witches dancing on Walpurgis Night. In Tyrol, folklore attributed fairy rings to the fiery tales of flying dragons. Once a dragon had created such a circle, nothing but toadstools could grow there for seven years. However, most common stories involve the dance of the fae. In both Sweden and Scandinavia, it is believed that fairy rings are burnt into the ground by the dancing of elves. You are warned that while entering, an elfdom might allow the interloper to see the elves, although this was not guaranteed. It would also put the intruder in thrall of their illusion. In Wales, fairies were almost invariably described as dancing in a group when encountered. 
An early 20th century Irish tradition says that fairies enjoy dancing around the hawthorn tree, and fairy rings can often be found surrounding these magical trees. But this is my favorite. In Victorian folklore, fairies and witches were regarded as related, based in part on the idea that both were believed to dance in circles. These revels are particularly associated with moonlit nights, the rings only becoming visible to mortals the following morning. Local variants add other details. It has been written that the brightness of the fairy ring comes not from the dancing of the fairies, who harm it with their feet, but from Puck, who refreshes the grass. A Welsh and Manx variant removes dancing from the picture and claims that fairy rings spring up over an underground fairy ring. I love that! These associations have become linked to specific sites. For example, the Pixies Church was a rock formation in Dartmoor surrounded by a fairy ring. Many myths generally paint fairy rings as dangerous places, best avoided. Superstition calls fairy rings sacred and warned against violating them, lest the interloper, such as a farmer with a plow, anger the fairies and be cursed. In an Irish legend, a farmer builds a barn on a fairy ring despite the protest of his neighbors, and he is struck senseless one night, and a local fairy doctor breaks the curse. The farmer says that he dreamt that he must destroy the barn. Even collecting dew from the grass or flowers within a fairy ring can bring bad luck. Destroying a fairy ring is unlucky and fruitless. Superstition says it will simply grow back. So does science, by the way, and we'll get to that later on. A tale from the Cambrian Mountains of Wales describes a mortal's encounter with a fairy ring. He saw them appearing like tiny soldiers, dancing in a ring. He set out for the scene of revelry, and soon drew near the ring where, in a gay company of males and females, they were footing it to the music of the harp. Never had he seen such handsome people, nor any so enchantingly cheerful. They beckoned him with laughing faces to join them, as they leaned backwards, almost falling, whirling, round and round, with joined hands. Those who were dancing never swerved from the perfect circle, while others chased each other with surprising swiftness in the greatest glee. Still others rode around on small white horses of the most beautiful form. All this was in silence, for the shepherd could not hear the harps, though he saw them. But now he drew nearer to the circle, and finally ventured to put his foot in the magic ring. The instant he did this, his ears were charmed with strains of the most melodious music he had ever heard. Numerous legends focus on mortals entering a fairy ring and the consequences. One superstition is that anyone who steps into an empty fairy ring will die at a young age. Entering the ring on May's Eve or All Hallows Night was especially dangerous. One source tells of a shepherd accidentally disturbing a ring of rushes where fairies were preparing to dance. They capture him and held him captive. He even marries one of them. Most often, however, someone who violates a fairy perimeter becomes invisible to mortals outside and may find it impossible to leave the circle. Often, the fairies force the mortal to dance to the point of exhaustion, death, or madness. In Welsh tales, fairies actively try to lure mortals into their circles to dance with them. Freedom from a fairy ring often requires outside intervention. A tactic from early 20th century Wales is to cast wild marjoram and thyme into the circle and befuddle the fairies. Another asks the rescuer to touch the victim with iron. Other stories require that the enchanted victim simply be plucked out by someone on the outside, although even this can be difficult. A farmer in a tale from the Langolan region had to tie a rope around himself and enlist four men to pull him from the circle as he goes in to save his daughter. A common element of these recoveries is that the rescuer must wait a year and a day from when the victim entered the ring. Another interesting correlation to the witchy realm, is it not? Mortals who have danced with the fairies are rarely safe 
even after being saved from their entrollment. Often, they find that what seems to be but a brief foray into fairyland was indeed much longer, in the mortal realm possibly weeks or years. The person rescued from the fairy ring may have no memory of the encounter with the spirits. As in a story from Anglicia, recorded in 1891, in most tales, the saved interloper faced a grim fate. For example, one legend states a man is rescued from a fairy ring only to crumble to dust. In another tale, a fairy ring survivor molders away when he eats his first bite of food. Another vulnerability seems to be iron. In another tale, a touch from the metal causes a rescued woman to disappear. Some legends assert that the only safe way to investigate a fairy ring is to run around it nine times. This affords the ability to hear the fairies dancing and frolicking underground. According to a 20th century tradition in Northumberland, this must be done under a full moon and the runner must travel in the direction of the sun. To go Windershins allows the fairies to place the runner under their sway. A story from the early 20th century England says that a mortal can see the spirits without fear if a friend places a foot on that of the person stepping beyond the circle's perimeter. Another superstition says that wearing a hat backwards can confuse the fairies and prevent them from pulling the wearer into their circle. Although they have strong associations with doom, some legends paint fairy circles as places of fertility and fortune. Welsh folk belief is that mountain sheep that eat the grass of a fairy ring flourish and the crops sown from such a place will prove more bountiful than those from normal land. A folk belief recorded in the Athenian oracle claims that a house built on a fairy circle will bring prosperity to its inhabitants. Likewise, a legend from Pont Iwern says that in the 13th to 14th century, the inhabitants of the town of Corian watched fairies dancing in a ring around a glow worm every Sunday after church at a place called Pen Ibong. They even joined the spirits in their revels. The legend survives in a rhyme, with the fairies nimbly dancing round the glow worm on the rising ground. John Rice recorded a Welsh tale in 1901. It tells of a man who lived in the early 19th century. The man destroyed a nest of rooks in a tree surrounded by a fairy ring. In gratitude, the fairies gave him a half crown every day, but stopped when he told his friend, for he had broken the rule of the fairy folk by making their liberality known. Nevertheless, fairy boons are not without their curses, and tales often tell of the sprites exacting their revenge. Fairy rings have featured in the works of European authors, playwrights, and artists since the 13th century. In an Arthurian romance, the title character visits the Chateau de Carol and sees a circle of women and a knight dancing around a pine in the castle courtyard. The knight is unable to fight the intense desire to join in, thus freeing the previous knight from the spell. He is now helpless to leave the dance until, ten weeks later, another knight joins in and frees him. Fairy circles feature in works by several Elizabethan poets and playwrights. William Shakespeare alludes to them in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Act 2, Scene 1, And I serve the fairy queen to do her orbs upon the green, and to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. And in The Tempest, Act 5, Scene 1, Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes, and groves, and ye that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him. When he comes back, you demi-puppets that by moonlight do the green sour ringlets make, whereof of the you not bites, and you whose pastime is to make moon night mushrooms. I do have it to admit, I enjoy Shakespeare, and Midsummer Night's Dream and Tempest are my favorites of his workings, which is probably not a huge surprise. Fairy rings have appeared in European artwork since at least the 18th century. For example, William Blake painted Oberon, Titania and Puck with fairies dancing, depicting a scene from Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night Dream. Daniel MacLeese painted Fawn and the Fairies around 1834. 
Images of fairies dancing in circles became a favorite trope of painters in the Victorian period. On the one hand, artists were generally interested in the culture such imagery represented. On the other hand, fairies could be depicted as titillatingly nudes and semi-nudes without offending Victorian mores, which made them a popular subject of art collectors. But fear not the fae. For like witches, the fairy rings have been given a bad rap. There is actually a scientific explanation for their creations. If you prefer to keep the magic myth and lore, you might want to skip to the Fae Magic Book Hall. A visit to MushroomAppreciation.com provides a great and thorough explanation for how these magical spaces are formed. These imaginative circles are the result of a particular pattern of mycelium growth. Mycelium is the underground organism that produces the reproductive fruit bodies that we know as mushrooms. This relationship is sometimes explained by comparison to an apple tree. If we think of mushrooms as apples, then the mycelium is the tree from which they fruit. In this analogy, the tree is underground, making mushrooms the living embodiment of as above, so below. In the case of a ring of mycelium starts at a single point and grows in a circular shape. It continues to push outward in an attempt to consume more nutrients. As it exhausts the nutrients on the inside of the ring, it will widen further and further as it looks for new food sources. This process results in an ever-growing ring. So why don't we see more of them? Although not uncommon, fairy rings don't just happen anywhere. Multiple factors influence the circular growth pattern, including soil type and conditions, amount of nutrients in the soil, obstructions underground, and dirt composition. The ground needs to be even and well composed. A reason why you'll often see them pop up on lawns. Is anyone else wishing they'd pop up on their lawns? I know I would love to have a fairy ring. The chance exists that you've seen more fairy rings than you realize. Although we only notice them when they produce mushrooms, the circular mycelium underground is always there and growing. So how do you recognize them? The most obvious clue is a circle of mushrooms. However, you can sometimes spot clues from the conditions of the grass. Sometimes you'll see either a ring of dark green grass or a ring of dry dead grass. Whether this ring looks lush or dead depends on the type of fungus growing and how it affects the soil. The dark circle occurs when the mycelium breaks down organic material and releases nitrogen. As grass needs nitrogen to grow, the added nutrients in the soil causes it to sprout up taller and darker than the grass around it. A dead area is called a necrotic zone, which is just a region of withered or discolored plant life caused by the fungi depleting the soil of nutrients, usually nitrogen. So if you seed an odd circle of either dead grass or dark green grass in your lawn, there's a chance that someday a circular ring of mushrooms will fruit. There are generally two types of mushroom fairy rings, free and tethered. These terms result from how the mushroom feeds itself and where the ring appears. Free rings are usually found in meadows, fields, or lawns. They're called free because they aren't connected with any other organism. The mushrooms that pop up in these rings will be saprotrophs, meaning they feed on dead or dying organic material. Tethered rings show up in the forests, usually with one or more tree in the center. These rings are considered tethered to the tree because the fungus is mycorrhizal. A mycorrhizal fungus is one that has a symbiotic relationship with the roots of the tree, expanding the tree's access to nutrients and water, and in return being given access to the sugars that the tree produces. There's some debate over which type is more truly common. Most people seem to report seeing the free rings more often, no doubt because they tend to pop up in more populated areas, such as lawns. But this does explain the connection of the hawthorn tree to fairy rings. Almost any type of ground fruiting mushroom could theoretically grow in a ring, but it's generally accepted that 60 or so species make this pattern. The most well-known in the fairy ring mushrooms or scotch bonnets, 
This edible species causes the grass to grow and become greener and is famous for fruiting in fairy rings. Some other species that you may recognize are the poisonous toadstool, the poisonous death cap, the poisonous green spurred parasol, the edible purple spored puffball, and the edible wood bluet. There's also the famous edible matsutake mushroom. Not to fair, I will be doing a few blog posts for the Midsummer Afternoon Tea, sharing the recipes and how to create the fairy lanterns, and will also include, or at least do my best to include, photos of these magically named mushrooms to keep an eye out for. It is important to note that edible and poisonous mushrooms produce fairy rings. For this reason, it's important to never use ring formation as a tool for mushroom identification and harvesting. Now for me, a perfect accompaniment to an afternoon tea is a good book. My soul sister Larissa recommended two books for serious workings with the Fae, both by Storm Fairy Wolf. I did purchase them a year back, but haven't had the time to actually begin my studies. This one downside to YouTube video creation is that most of the books that I read are to research content, not so much for personal growth and development as I would like. In the fall, I'd love to begin my journey with the books, and if you're interested in either, please let me know. I'd love to try buddy reading them. Before I read the back of the books, I do want to stress that information in a book represents one person's connection, whether it be to the fae, crystals, herbs from a magical standpoint, and that is the author's connection. It's one way, but not the only way. If you've established relationships with them, books like these can help advance them, but take what resonates with your relationship with the fae. You don't have to follow someone else's path. Respect it, but trust yourself. This isn't a religion, it's simply building connection with another life form. Just as you would build friendships with family, co-workers, neighbors, and strangers from across the sea who've become like kin. And just like those relationships, it's important to remember that the Fae have their own personalities. Not all of them might get on with you. They also have their own agendas, and they may not always be in alignment with your own. The Fae are not to be commanded, trapped, or used. You would not appreciate having those things done to you, so please treat them with the same level of respect you would ask for in return. In truth, treat them with greater respect. They are ancient beings and have so much to teach us. One day, I will share with my patrons my personal connection on a soul level with the Fae Kin, but for now, that is a story for another time and place. The first book is called Forbidden Mysteries of Fairy Witchcraft by Storm Fairy Wolf. The back of the book reads, Draw your inner darkness and unlock the secrets of the hidden kingdom. Whether your demons are ancient spirits or demons of your own making, you must confront them in order to reclaim the power that they have stolen. This book helps you cultivate and explore your forsaken shadows. When you peer behind the veil of comfort and face your most powerful fears, you can truly begin to refine and strengthen your own magical will. In Forbidden Mysteries of Fairy Witchcraft, you will learn how to summon primal underworld goddesses of the elemental power, walk the bone road and help trap spirits cross over, which is something my grandmother used to do, become a worthy vessel for divine possession, perform as an oracle speaking the wisdom of the gods on earth, cast and break curses, the dark art of offensive magic. The powerful techniques of the fairy tradition of witchcraft await. Through these rituals, you will glimpse the secret inner workings of nature herself and open the door to unimaginable sources of energy. Now, I do want to state I do not believe in causing harm in any way, but my grandmother did teach me to understand the full scope of the type of magic that can be wielded because knowledge is its own defense. The next book is called Betwixt and Between, I gotta say the title caught me, Exploring the Fairy Tradition of Witchcraft. Same author. The back reads, Still we tend the sacred fire and join the fairy dance. Fairy is a tradition of great power and beauty, originating in the west coast of the United States separate from the Wicca tradition in England. Fairy's appeal is grounded in its focus on power and results. 
This book provides the tools you need to begin your own fairy style magical practice. Discover the foundations, mythology, and rites of the fairy traditions, as well as steps and techniques for creating an altar, summoning the fairy fire, engaging the shadow, exploring the personal trinity, purifying the primal soul, working with the iron pentacle, aligning your life force, developing spirit alliances, journeying between the worlds, exploring air, fire, water, and earth, and enhancing fairy power. Personal experimentation and creative exploration are the heart and soul of fairy. The rituals, recipes, exercises, and lore within will help you project your consciousness into realms beyond this world, opening you to the experience of spiritual ecstasy. If you want to know a little bit about Storm Fairy Wolf, the author of the two books, he is a professional author, teacher, artist, poet, warlock, priest, and initiate of the fairy tradition of witchcraft. He has over 30 years of experience practicing the magical arts and has been teaching both privately and publicly for more than 20. He holds the black wand of a master and is the founder of Blue Rose, a school of lineage of the fairy tradition, offering classes and community both in person and online. He is the author of The Stars Within the Earth, co-host of the Modern Witch Podcast, and co-owner of The Mystic Dream, a spiritual and occult book and supply shop. So there you go. Yes, I purchased both books. No, there's no affiliation, but I thought I'd share the information with you so that if you're interested in buddy reading with me in the fall, you can purchase the book, get in contact with me, and we can explore together. In a few hours, I'll be meeting up with my Patreons for a live Midsummer Storytime Tea Tales from the Caribbean. I hope to do more of these teas and tales, so if you're interested, please join us. You can find the link in the description below, and I will pin it to the comments. If you're looking for other ideas on how to celebrate the summer solstice, Letha, or Midsummer, by whatever name you associate this magical time, I have two videos from last year that are more on the ritual spiritual crafting side than the fun playful one of this year. In those videos I make a ritually infused floral honey and then use it to craft a honey cake. I also explain the significance of the herbs used and one of the ways that I ritually celebrate this auspicious day. For now I must bid you all a magical Midsummer's Eve. May the Fae grant you your heart's desires and may you work hard to bring it into manifestation. Many blessings.